Hello everyone and welcome to a new podcast on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. I'm Anton Garcia Fernandez. And I'm Aaron Garcia Fernandez. And we're sitting here uh, at the table uh, of our kitchen here in Jackson, Tennessee with some coffee ready to drink. Uh, a little bit more here in case we need some more, a little milk right there. And we're going to be talking today about a show that we have recently seen mm -hmm. on Netflix. And it's a show that um, we really enjoyed and we simply would like to give it a little bit more exposure by means of this uh, podcast. And the title of it is? Farina. And that's a Galician, uh, a Galician word from the northwest of Spain uh, that in Spanish would be harina. But in English, they have translated this uh, very differently. They don't call it flour. What do they call it? They call it cocaine coast. Cocaine coast, that's right. And so um, there's very specific reason why the title of the show uh, in English is Cocaine Coast, why the title of the show originally in Galician is Farina, meaning flour. Uh, and it's because this is a new Netflix show produced in Spain about the drug smuggling clans off the Galician coast in northwestern Spain during the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, I remember names like Cito Miñanco, like Laureano Viña, uh, or the clan of the Charlines, uh, being constantly in the news when I was growing up. So as we talk about this show today, Aaron, uh, we're going to have uh, a little bit more of an insider's perspective. <laughs> not necessarily. I hope it's not too inside. Not necessarily because I was a drug smuggler myself, but back because... Back in the 80s. Not, not back in the 80s or at any point, <laughs> but because um, I was growing up while this was happening in that part of the world, and we're going to have a little bit more of an outsider's perspective because, of yes. course, you're not a drug smuggler as far as I know. No, and I wasn't uh, living on Cocaine Coast in the 80s and 90s. What do you think about the title to begin with, Cocaine Coast, as opposed to the uh, slang word in Galician Farina? Do you think it's a, it's a good um, uh, substitution, it's a good translation? Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think for people who aren't familiar with the, the area, it's nice in some way that they get the word coast in there because it gives people who may not know much about Spain and certainly not much about Galicia a sense of it being, you know, on the ocean. Um, and it obviously gets to the point. But no, I think Farina as a name has a lot more subtlety to it. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a slang word that I'm sure everybody knew and knows, but um, it it talks about a simpler kind of lifestyle and then a more complex lifestyle depending on what kind of farina or flour you're talking about. And in this case we're obviously talking about uh, cocaine. It's a slang word, it's a slang term uh, in Galician and also in Spanish for cocaine, something like what in English would be something like blow perhaps. Yeah. But of course calling it blow would not be would not have been a good a good idea. No. Well and there's that the film Blow with Johnny Depp. Um, which is also, you know, about drug culture. So they probably wanted to differentiate it from that as well. This is a show that um, we heard about through uh, our friend uh, Guy Jones, who lives in Stockholm, Sweden. He told us about it. Uh, he'd been watching it on Netflix over in Europe. And then my father, uh, he also um, mentioned that it was a very good show. I read some of the uh, reviews, and they were very promising. And so we just decided to watch it at nights on Netflix. It's on Netflix for streaming right now here in the United States and uh, it's really a very uh, recommendable show. Yeah. Luckily it's in the original version. Um, I don't know if you can select a dubbing option or not but we recommend the original version because you get to hear a lot of Galician in Spanish and it doesn't, you know, I mean we, we just like watching things in their original version because you lose so much of the expression and the, I don't know, the the feeling of, of, you know, a piece when you when you see it and it's dubbed. And if you know a little bit of Spanish, uh, of course, if you know a little Galician or Portuguese, you know, uh, you I think you'll you'll enjoy it even more. I think they do a very good job at mixing the Spanish. It's mostly in Spanish, but it does have a lot of uh, Galician words and phrases uh, and idioms thrown in 
Uh, I think they do a very good job at mixing the two languages which, which uh, coexist in the northwest of Spain, Spanish and uh, uh, Galician. It also stars a pretty good cast of mostly Galician actors. Uh, a lot of these actors I also remember uh, on Galician TV and Spanish TV growing up. Uh, they've been really part of my TV viewing life because um, these are actors that appear over and over again in different TV shows and also um, you know, in, in movies in Spain and in, in the Northwest in Galicia. Um, and we have particularly uh, Javier Rey, who uh, plays the drug lord Cito Miñanco. Uh, and uh, you, may, you may remember, uh, although it's, it's really hard to, to, um, uh, to make him out, really, uh, but you may remember this actor from another TV show that you can watch on Netflix as well. It's a totally different show called Velvet um, <clears throat> that we, we watched uh, for the first season or two uh, when it was on. It's a very, you know, nice way to practice your Spanish. Um, it's about a clothing line, clothing store uh, in Spain in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and it's kind of a romantic comedy of sorts, I guess, as, as far as TV show genres go. Um, we, we stopped watching it after a little while because it got a little too cheesy. But um, yeah, Javier Rey plays Mateo in Velvet. But I did not recognize him at all. Neither did I, really. In uh, Farina, because he's just a totally different character. He looks quite different. To me, I thought, and um, even when we, we were looking him up after the first episode to see what else he had been in, and it said on his, his resume, list, again, yeah, so. it said Velvet, and I thought, well, who, who was he in Velvet? And he's one of the main characters. Happens so. to be one of the protagonists, really, but he, yeah. he, the, the makeup and the, the, his appearance here is totally different. Uh, and well, uh, in, you, in, I mean, in, in, just in your opinion, he, he, he does a better job in this. Yeah, I mean, I... I liked him a lot better in Farim than I did in Velvet. Um, he, you know, he's a funny character in Velvet, um, kind of a, a bit of a scoundrel, but a likable scoundrel. Um, but I found him a little bit irritating on that show. And, um, I mean, it's not like he's lovable as <laughs> Cito Mignanco, um, but they actually make him an interesting character. And for, you know, knowing... Uh, the fate of the characters from the get-go, as you did, because you're familiar with their history, they were, I guess, aiming to make him um, a character that you could still root for, which is a little bit of a tricky task. And it's uh, not easy to do either. For, for, for a drug dealer as, as big and as uh, important as he was. He definitely is the main character... Uh in this uh, Cocaine Coast show, uh, and he does a really good job. Um, I realized that actually uh, watching the show that he was actually he is actually from yeah. Galicia, from the mm -hmm. northwest, which, which you, you can't know, tell that in you Velvet. You can't tell in Velvet, no, because mm -hmm. his accent is totally different. Um, and then we also have Tristan Ulloa. He's been on many Spanish movies and TV shows, long career as an actor, uh, and he plays uh, Dario Castro, the police inspector, hounding. Uh, the smugglers throughout the ten episodes, um, and um, you know he he has his ups and downs, and <laughs> it's a very difficult um, uh, task for him, as 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 you will realize if you start watching the show, uh, how complicated all of this is. Uh, and Tristan Ulloa really does a good job. He does a good job officer. of capturing the frustration because he comes so close so many times to 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 getting the, the, this group of drug dealers into making headway uh, in his efforts, and they seem to be undone time after time, and, and he, he keeps at it. Um, I don't know very much about the, the real-life man, but they seem to have um, based a lot of this on you know, historical accounts. So. Yes, it's, it's based on uh, historical accounts, on uh, real facts, yeah. you know, and I'm sure this uh, ins inspector kind of conflates uh, all different right. sorts of inspectors. Right. And, but and, there was and certainly a very long, it was a long-term commitment to, to get these people um, in, in a legally binding way. 
and imprison them. I would say that all of the uh, actors do a good job uh, putting on the right Galician accent when they speak, uh, whether they are from the southern part of Galicia where this is um, uh, set or, or not. Uh, my least favorite uh, might be uh, Hanna Perez, who plays Camila, the uh, girlfriend of uh, Cito Minyanko, and not because she does a bad job as an actress, I think, you know, she, she does an okay job, uh, but mostly because she's playing a Panamanian woman, and mm -hmm. she is not from Panama, and I don't think that she does as good a job with the accent uh -huh. as maybe uh, somebody from Panama. Yeah. If they really had had a, a, an actress from, from Panama, probably yeah. would have been a better choice yeah. for that. I mean, that certainly isn't something that bothered me, because I'm just not as attuned to uh, what the Panamanian accent should be. Um, she She... Certainly, um, you know, plays the role of the femme fatale thoroughly uh, in this, and so she she does a good job. Um, but she's no, she's not my favorite uh, character. I think her character though is is pretty well written in that you know it's hard to tell really uh, throughout the the show what her. Um, yeah intentions uh, yeah. pursuing a relationship with Sito Minyanko really are. Yeah. yeah. So I think she does a good job at that. Yeah. I just wish that they had maybe used a Panamanian actress yeah. to, you know, to portray uh, this, this Panamanian character. Uh, as we uh, have already mentioned, there's 10 episodes, uh, about one per year. This starts around 1981. Well, it, before, goes, we, before we talk yes. about the episodes, I think we should talk about at least one more character because I feel like the sort of ultimate villain mm -hmm. of Cocaine Coast is not Sito Mignanco, mm -hmm. even though he is like this head drug lord that they they want to capture um over time he doesn't start out at the top but um to me uh the father of the charlinas clan is mm -hmm. really the one who comes across as just the the worst the creepiest the meanest the roughest uh, and this is somebody that I think you knew as well from other... Yeah, this programs. is an actor uh, whose who um, uh, stage name is Morris, and he has been on countless TV shows, uh, specifically uh, one that I can remember very well called Pratos Combinados, which um, had to do with um, a uh, restaurant in a small town, and it was really basically simply a... Um, sitcom of sorts. Uh, so this is a completely different uh, role for Morris. Uh, he does a great job uh, as the um, uh, boss of the Charlin clan. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a character that's hard to play because there's absolutely no comic relief with him. He, no, he's he, pretty hateable. He's really hateable, <laughs> he's pretty, <laughs> I would say. He's pretty horrible. Really violent. Uh, I mean, and his, um, his, children, his sons are horrible. His daughter has a lot of horrible qualities and yet you feel bad for them when they're around their father because he's that horrible. And you can, and you can kind of understand maybe why, <laughs> why they, they are, are the way that, they yeah. are. I think they do a good job really portraying their relationship between yeah. uh, and the, the family and, dynamics and between Pilar, the clients. And Pilar uh, Charlene was uh, really well played as well um, because she is um, clearly um, more intelligent than the other children in the family, mm -hmm. and and she's the daughter. Of out of uh, the daughter of the what was his? I don't remember his Manolo, mm -hmm. uh, Charlene, uh, but clearly out of place because as a woman she really wasn't supposed to have any role in the family business. Though um, she will have a role, but she so has far. a very prominent role and actually um, helps the family out of really big problems multiple times. Um, so I, I thought they were very well played, as, as the characters go. Laureano Viña, also really well yeah. played by Carlos yeah. Blanco, an actor who uh, is really a comedian. And, uh, he's, he's, he, he's a stand-up comedian, and he has also been on Galician TV as a TV host yeah. of different shows, and he's been on also you know comedy shows yeah. and sitcoms of it's, different kinds. It's funny, one of the things this show does is it, not not entirely, but it makes several of these drug dealers likable. <laughs> Cito Mignanco, in some ways, is very likable. He's supposed to almost be kind of like a uh, 
a man of the people and he helps all of you know the the local um communities uh and Ovinia is also quite likable he comes across as uh funny and um not a bad guy, which, you know, we, we joked as we were watching the show and said, you know, these guys were probably far worse than they are portrayed yes. in the story. And yet I do understand why they characterize several of them in this way, because um, it it is sort of a, a cat and mouse kind of story. It's not just a documentary about them. It's mm-hmm. a, a chase, if you will. Um, and so in order... To keep your interest, you have to kind of root for some of them. I mean, I wanted uh, Manolo Chavalin to be caught right away, but <laughs> but the <laughs> other guys, uh, you you're tempted to go. Oh well, they're you know <laughs> they're not so bad, even though they were. You're listening to a new podcast on uh, the YouTube channel of Anton GF, and uh, my name is Anton Garcia Fernandez. And I'm Aaron Garcia Fernandez. And we are having coffee here in our kitchen in Jackson, Tennessee, and chatting about a show we've been recently watched on Netflix, uh, on, on the streaming service of Netflix, called Cocaine Coast, in English, but in Galician. Farinha. And this is a show that uh, was based on a book by the uh, journalist Nacho Carretero. In fact, my, my sister is friends with this, mm-hmm. with this man. Um, he wrote uh, this uh, book uh, as, as, as an account of the many years of drug smuggling off the northwestern coast of Spain based on uh, documents from the trials, judicial documents of different kinds. Uh, however, the book uh, earlier this year was seized uh, by court order in Spain because... Um, one of the, I think it was the mayor of one of the cities uh, mentioned in this, or little towns mentioned in, um, in, in the book and also in the show later, um, the, the mayor felt that, you know, th- they were slandering the name of the city and his own name, and, and so he sued the... Um, uh, or, or presented some sort of complaint, mm-hmm. uh, and there was a judge in Madrid that uh, seized the book, uh, but of course the seizure uh, order was later lifted, and so that you know didn't really become uh, much of a problem. But originally, mm-hmm. uh, it was because it wasn't possible to find the book in Spain. People had to go to Portugal to buy it. Wow. Uh, I, I think that on Amazon.es, the, the Spanish version of Amazon, the, the, the sales just skyrocketed because, <laughs> because of <they> this. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing that the book wasn't seized because there was there's really no libel within the book. Mm-hmm. Apparently, we haven't really had the chance no, to read the book. Read it. Uh, but it's not a very good sign when a book is seized uh, of, of, of how the uh, legal system of a country works, really. Well, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I would always be um, one to, to err on the side of allowing any, any kind of publication um, to, to be um, printed and shared. Uh, you know, if you have a case against a book... Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, unless it's a very clear yeah, case of libel, yeah, or, uh, then or, or, or if there are some know, hate crimes I, I, yeah. related no, to it or yes, something like that. But in this case, but, you no. know, none of that seemed to be the case. Um, we also would like to mention, and I think this is you know quite important, um, the theme song of, yeah. of this, of this uh, show. If you've seen the show already, you will realize that there's a theme song that appears not just at the beginning of the show uh, of each episode, but also throughout the. Yeah. The, the show it's, it's a brief song, times. though. I mean, it doesn't. Um, some theme songs go on for a long time, and, and so it, especially them, the some of them a little too much. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> especially the first episode or two, it, you just get some brief moments of of the song. Well, the song was written by Ivan Ferreiro, the former leader of the 1990s pop group Los Piratas or the Pirates. I remember this group uh, really well on on, on the radio uh, growing up. Um, and there are many different versions of the tune throughout the series. As you said, it was a short um, mm-hmm. song, but not, not all of them were sung 
by Ivan Ferreiro. Some of them are, right. some of them are not. And um, when you hear the song, you'll have to uh, note that the sh song is not really in Spanish. You you, no. you might know Spanish, and you're thinking, well, I'm not really understanding what he's singing about. Yeah, it's in Galician. Um, Ivan Ferreiro doesn't usually sing in Galician, but in this case, uh, he did the song in in Galician. Mm -hmm. And um, the 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 song in in English translation uh, says something like, "This is what I have to do so as not to work at sea." Mm -hmm. uh, that those those first two. Um, lines are important in that, you know, for a lot of the youth, the youngsters living in these uh, small fishing villages in Galicia, uh, drug smuggling and helping the smugglers uh, was a way of making easy, fast money and not having to go off for right. uh, several months at a time um, to work at sea as fishermen. Right. Um, it, you know, as is... I would think often the case when um, crime starts to take over communities, it takes over in places where people don't have a lot of opportunity, and it comes as an opportunity. It presents itself as an option where there aren't many. Uh, and so you have um, a lot of the community, and, and that's one of the things I think the show does well, is it shows how much the different levels of the community get, um, you know, interwoven with these drug lords and this drug culture um, because and and clearly people like Sito Mignaco, um worked off that and played off of that because uh, people wanted their help and Ivan Ferreiro captures this really well lo que tengo que hacer para no tener que ir mar this is what I have to do so as not to work at sea and then uh, the song also says, uh, Hay moito peixe que vender e farinha para amassar. So, meaning there's a lot of fish to sell and flour to knead. And of course, fish mm -hmm. is really an important part of the economy of uh, a lot of these uh, seaside fishing villages in the northwest of Spain, and really all over Spain, but very, very uh, specifically in the northwest of Spain. And then when they use the word farinha there, uh, yeah. that already is, um, uh, you know, relating uh, the song to the, not just the title of the uh, show, mm -hmm. but also the, the, the main topic, mm -hmm. since the word farinha, as we said, is slang for cocaine. Well, and it also, it has that double meaning there of, like, the a simple culture of people who are just selling fish and needing flour for bread, and then the, the flour, the, the cocaine that they're selling. Um... And that was something that they end up doing, too, in the show that I thought was interesting. Um, further on in the show, when some of the legal processes begin, uh, the, some of the um, <clears throat> attorneys try to take advantage of um, Galician stereotypes in Spain. Um, and that's something uh, that I knew a little bit about already, you know, because... Uh, t you know, talking to you, you told me about, you know, the way people sort of imagine Galicia and Spain. But if you don't know much about Spain in different regions, um, it's, it's in some ways comparable to the way the South is sometimes mm -hmm. portrayed in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, where um, people are uh, presented as not having as much education, education being yes. very simple-minded, um, not being sophisticated enough to be drug uh, lures, which was the the image they were trying to present in court, which 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 of course was not, not true the case. because it wasn't true. you know they, right. they they're not incredibly sophisticated. But, no, well they but they, they definitely do have an they, education, right? They clearly did, but that's why I thought it was interesting that they were presenting um, those stereotypes as taken for granted to to an extent that they would use it as a defense in court. Yeah, almost the, like they couldn't read or yeah, write properly, right. and so and how were, would they know what they were signing, they and, you know, that sort of thing. You know, do these things. Uh, you mentioned before, uh, and I think that's 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 very um, interesting, uh, that this this show really gives us a good portrayal of the huge influence that the smugglers had on the small fishing villages uh, where they lived in the south of 
the northwest of Spain, mm -hmm. so in the south of Galicia, mm -hmm. uh, which is incidentally where I was born and grew up. So yeah. um, I could recognize, if not the exact places, uh, definitely the feel and the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of rain on this show. Yeah. Uh, just like we have rain right now here in Jackson, yeah. maybe as a nod to the kind of uh, <laughs> uh, weather that, that, that is typically, typically associated with Galicia. And uh, really, there's a lot of that mm -hmm. uh, on the show. But, but don't you think that uh, there's a, they do a good job uh, showing uh, the influence that the smugglers had over the people that, li that, that, that lived in these uh, Galician villages. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of why it takes um, the detective, is it Darío, so long um, <clears throat> to make headway in his case against these guys because there were so many people, um, be they politicians or just local families, that um, for, for different reasons would um, either cover for them or help them in different ways uh, I mean and there's all kinds of um, informants and um, people that have been bribed uh, right. politicians <clears throat> and it gets to a point there's, there's a point in time when you know there are several different periods of time that they cover and at one point Sito's on the run and you know he's he has to get out of town, and you think, how in the world is he going to be able to do that? Um, but you realize as he's, you know, moving through the city, everywhere he looks, he's pretty confident that there are going to be multiple people who will help him, and he, he just has to flash his eyes at a couple people, and they, you know, they look the other way, or, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, various times in the show they try to suggest that it isn't because they're afraid of him um, because you you could get you know um, loyalty through fear but mm -hmm. it's a an even stronger kind of loyalty because he has done things for the community rather than um, making them uh, afraid through violence. They're, they're profiting from his business, yeah. uh, not as much, obviously, as he does himself, no. but they are, and so, you know, they feel a certain kind of loyalty or indebtedness to him, right? right? And I think that's, that's also really well portrayed. Um, and actually, uh, in contrast with that, the series also concentrates a little bit on the problems brought about by the drug addiction of the, the youth that uh, live in these yeah. uh, villages, uh, but even better than that, they, the show chronicles the uh, efforts of some parents, mostly mothers, mostly yeah. women, uh, who very vividly uh, and very aggressively, in some yeah. cases, denounce and, and protest against the, the drug lords. Yeah, well, they actually um, <clears throat> are, to me, the, the tactics that they use are very um, similar to what you see more and more today with groups that you know, are using social media to meet up and come up with causes, or not come up with causes, but um, talk about causes that they uh, are passionate about and finding ways to get together to protest. And I mean, obviously, protest protesting is, a, is, a, is not a new thing, um, but they are very vocal in the community um, and persistent and loud. And when they don't know what to do, they just show up and make noise. Mm -hmm. And they chant. And... It, because they say there's no way for them to get to the drug dealers, um, it, even through the law, because there's so many police officers and politicians that are being bribed that they feel like within the community there's no way to get at them. And so they have to make enough noise that it, it gets attention outside of the community. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, before social media. Right. Uh, several, a couple, of, at least a couple of decades before right, right. social media in the 1980s. And so, you know, they're, they're really, maybe because this is a small community, but they're pretty successful uh, uh -huh. in, 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 their, in their getting together right. and protesting. Well, and, and that's one of the, the things that I had mentioned to you about the show. For it being a show about drugs, they only very briefly discuss uh, or show anybody doing drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you, there are a few characters that work within the uh, or work for the drug lords that that take drugs 
And then you have maybe one kid that we see who has, uh, we know, ongoing problems with drugs, and we see him shoot up uh, and, you know, end up in the hospital once or twice. But there's not much um, attention put on that aspect. Um, so it's, it's something that's there in the background, and in a way I feel like it, it's removed so that we can focus on um, <clears throat> how these people, how Sito Mignanco rose to so much power in the mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. um, and so then when these moms come into the picture, you almost sort of feel the way the, the drug dealers felt, that it came out of nowhere. Because, mm -hmm. of course, their world and what they experience is all the wealth coming in from the drugs. And so they, they just manage to ignore or block out what they're really bringing into the region. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't think about it. They don't, you know. And so um, the moms come in and you go, oh, yeah, you know, this is about <laughs> all these um, young people um, becoming drug addicts and dying or, you know, um, having their lives ruined. And so it, it's interesting because... Um, it becomes uh, another opponent to, like for Sito, you have Dario at the beginning who's chasing them all this way, and then you have these other opponents who suddenly appear and remind you of what they've really been doing. You have to think also that uh, you know a lot of the uh, hash and a lot of the cocaine that uh, entered Spain in the 1980s and early 1990s, and a lot of the uh, drugs that entered Europe, really, from Morocco, from mm -hmm. from uh, South America, they actually entered through yeah. that Galician yeah. coast. Well, so. and that was, I do know that that was a very well-known port in, in the whole coastline, um, port of entry into Europe. Um, you know, I, I study Victorian literature, and, and there are even essays written by Thackeray that talk about um, his traveling by boat into a Galician port. Uh, I think it's Vigo, your mm -hmm. hometown. Yeah. And... Um, talking about um, what a, a presence it was because it did bring so much um, traffic in terms of goods, and in this case illegal goods, into, into Europe. It really is still, the Port of Vigo is one of the uh, most important, one of the biggest in Europe and comparable in the English-speaking world, I would guess, with Liverpool, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, you're listening to a new episode of a podcast, which is not really a series of podcasts, uh, here on the YouTube channel Anton GF. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez. And I'm Aaron Garcia Fernandez. We're having some coffee, although I don't think you have any more. No, left I finished time. my coffee. Yeah. And talking about this show on Netflix that we really enjoyed and that we um, recommend to everyone out there listening to us on YouTube. Cocaine Coast is the title in English. And Farinha. Is the title in Galician, meaning flower, F-L-O-U-R. Now, uh, as we wind down this uh, conversation on Cocaine Coast, um, remember the show has 10 episodes. It begins like around 1980, 1981, goes all the way to 1990, 1991. So it's more or less a year per uh, episode. Uh, there's only one season and I don't think there's going to be any more because it basically chronicles mm -hmm. that whole heyday mm -hmm. of um, criminals like Cito Mignanco, Laureano Viña, the clan of the Charlinas and everybody else. Um, since you mentioned, or we mentioned the, uh, the women that uh, uh, are working hard at denouncing and protesting against the, the drug lords, mm -hmm. uh, we, we must also talk a little bit about the uh, portrayal of women within the mm -hmm. drug smuggling clans, um, though though that is seemingly a mostly a man's world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the series also does a good job portraying the important role mm -hmm. of some of the uh, women within the clans, especially when their husbands or, yeah. or their fathers yeah. uh, are away or serving a uh, or jail arrested. sentence. <laughs> uh, at some point they're away in Portugal, yeah. uh, trying to run away from the law. Uh, some other cases they're in jail. And so there are women like Esther Lago, for mm -hmm. example, the uh, wife of Laureano Viña, one of the smugglers. Uh, and then, of course, Pilar, mm -hmm. the daughter of another one of the smugglers, uh, the, the daughter of the Charlines. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think um, that is something that, you know, one might not think about in that usually when we talk about mm, shows that deal with uh, narcotics and with drug smuggling and that sort of thing, it's usually, um, it usually concentrates a lot more on men. And this show does it, of course. Mm -hmm. But then uh, right there and very prominently in some of the episodes, we see some female characters. Yeah, um, and I, I thought they did a good job with that, and clearly these were women who did play a part, did take a role, because as we said, this was um, based on the book that was, you know, uh, researched with historical documents, and um, obviously there could be, you know, elements that were um, fabricated, but uh, they they did play a pretty big role, and I thought that was interesting, and there was definitely, um, especially for... Pilar Charlene pushback. Um, she had a very important role to play and helped the family multiple times, and yet um, her father and her brothers um, clearly felt extremely uncomfortable with her in that role, um, and yet she had enough, um, I don't know, interest and um, intelligence to. to to push, and stamina, too. Right, to push ahead in that position um, at several different times. She never breaks away from the family. And you, I kind of, you know, like you're waiting for her to do it because she could go, I don't want, oh, it's like, you're you know, yeah, you're really like, well, I mean, I don't want another drug dealer, but like, go, go into business for yourself, Pilar, but she doesn't. And I do think that does speak to the traditional um, element of, uh, the community that she came from, that she doesn't just walk away ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when her, f and, and I don't know uh, much about this, but when, when her family at one point is arrested, she's not arrested. And I don't know if it's because they just assumed she didn't do anything or they just, they didn't have, doc because um, Esther Lago mm -hmm. is arrested, mm -hmm. but Pilar Charlin is not. Uh, but she clearly uh, was very capable, as was Esther Lago, uh, and um, both of them are uh, come across as very strong business women. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting. And um, the mother, the main uh, leader of the mother's group, and I don't remember mm -hmm. her name, but she's clearly um, very uh, effective in what she does as well. So they have a lot of strong female characters. Um, one thing that I I noticed. In, in terms of um, the relationships with female characters in the show is that Sito, <clears throat> for being one of the more <laughs> likable drug dealers, um, has a more distant relationship with the female characters. He, he mm -hmm. um, very quickly has problems with his wife and his relationship with his wife and daughters get, it becomes very distant. Um, and he, you know, pursues a relationship with Camila over a long period of time, and, and as, as I said before, she really does play a femme fatale kind of character with him, um, and yet when he interacts with her, um, it's not in the same way, for instance, that Obina mm -hmm. interacts with his wife Esther. They don't, there's not like a partnership there, um, and it's not, they don't even show him being that rough with Camila, but I don't know if it's because she wasn't interested in the business, mm. um, but she does seem to be a driving factor early on. And so I was, you know, curious about that because Obina seems to be, have a strong relationship mm -hmm. with his wife in that regard and really brings her into the business, which I guess in the long run was not a good thing for their family. But, um, and Pilar really gets drawn into the business despite her, her father mm -hmm. and brothers. But Camila, maybe she just doesn't want to be involved, but Sito doesn't seem to have that same kind of partnership um, and, and doesn't seem to care very much when his wife and daughters um, distance themselves from him. No, Sito and Camila seem to be two very um, independent characters that somehow are thrown together by... The, the, and stick the, this, with each other for a while. They do. Uh, one wonders if through mutual interest, yeah. uh, because yeah. of the money that yeah. will be made out of these uh, illegal business ventures, yeah. 
or because they really feel something for right. for each other. It's not clear, and I think that's one of the things that they do a good job at. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the real Cito Mignanco was like that or not, it doesn't necessarily matter, right. because once we enter the uh, realm of fiction, you know, history right. changes completely, so right. it's not the same thing, obviously, uh, and it doesn't matter, right. uh, at least not to me. Mm, but what's interesting about those two characters is, is what you're mentioning, that, uh, that they seem to have a very conflicted sort of uh, relationship, because it's not clear uh, what is driving that relationship. Right. Is it, is it, is it, is it a, a relationship only of a sexual nature? It doesn't look like that. It seems like uh, it at moments, it seems like that. Um, but then they have other moments when they seem to suggest that there's more there, that they care about each other. Is it just the money, they, maybe? I don't know. But, yeah, they go back and forth, and it's hard to tell. But he still, it just, it's just something that stood out, because some of those women played such a big part, and Camila doesn't. Now, Sito's mom and his parents kind of stay in the picture, and I think... Again, that's one of those things that they sort of use to make him seem like a, a family guy and a man of the people, mm -hmm. of the community, because he wants to take care of his parents. But that doesn't have a lot of depth to it mm -hmm. in the show. Mm -hmm. And he just seems, you know, different in in that way from Ovinia or, you know, the... the um, even the husband of the, the main... Uh, leader in the mother's group, he's very supportive of his wife's mm -hmm. efforts. Yes. Um, Cito, it's harder to tell. It's difficult not to concentrate on Cito, uh, because yeah. uh, even in real life he was really one of the most high profile yeah. of these smugglers, and the show he definitely is the main character, I, yeah. I, I think. Uh, he first appears as the uh, young rookie, uh, but soon works his way to the top. Yeah, well, and they have this scene, and I won't say what happens. It's one of the main things where he kind of, it's his, like, coming-of-age moment where he becomes this drug dealer, but it's this larger-than-life episode mm -hmm. that you, you just think he's headed for disaster from the beginning, and then what he does, um, and he really did do it, it it's kind of... Um, astonishing that that was one of the I think the key moments of the show that gets you hooked because you're like yes. well, how did he do that um so I, I mean I, but he did but and, he, and he did larger than life things I think it, at least they seem to be that way they seem but, to be but I mean if he days. did but but they say like that that and they give you some information at the end of the episode to, to back up like the he really does you know this this episode happens the way they presented it in the episode and it it's that was pretty astonishing he does become the most successful of uh, the smugglers and he's also the first to favor switching from tobacco they began smuggling tobacco that was something i i, I wanted to talk and, about and that's yeah. something very important because um we, we have to think that originally in the 1970s and in the early 80s uh the the main activity of these smugglers focused on tobacco not on cocaine, not on hash, uh, not on hard drugs, but on tobacco. Now, uh, the opportunity to uh, switch from tobacco to harder drugs was not um, accepted by some of the tobacco smugglers. There's mm -hmm. one older person uh, by the name of Terito who decides that he does not want to be involved with the harder drugs. He just wants to work with tobacco because that's what he's always done and it's uh -huh. always worked for him. Um, but Cito is one of the first uh, smugglers who actually pushes uh, toward yeah. moving from tobacco and concentrating on cocaine. Right. Well, at first he wants to, and then he realizes how dangerous it is, that it is really a different, a whole different um, scenario, and so he backs off, and he doesn't want to get involved, but then the show almost makes it seem like the drug dealers are pushed into it because um, the law changes and now they're going to face jail time for smuggling tobacco. So they think, well, we might as well smuggle drugs then because we'll make a lot more money. The payoff will be better. Um, and it's the same same punishment either way. Which was really a trick by the government and by the police in order to catch them red hand. Yeah, yeah. With something other than tobacco, which would not really warrant a Wouldn't jail sentence. Wouldn't have as much weight. Probably to just it. a fine, right. a monetary fine. Right. But when it's cocaine, the whole thing changes. Right. But it's one of the things, and I mean, I don't, I don't know enough, but that they do in the show um, to make it seem as if these, these Galician drug 
dealers are not that bad because they juxtapose them with the Colombian drug dealers that you know first start introducing them to the to this new possibility of of bringing cocaine uh, to Galicia, and there's this you know stark violence in contrast to um, these. A more paternalistic sort of yeah yeah like it's it's business, it's just right? like a community kind of a thing and they they're smuggling tobacco but it's pretty similar to what they do if they're fishermen they're just just illegal <laughs> tobacco you know but like they really try to make it seem like it's not a big deal and I mean to be fair smuggling tobacco is not the same thing as as smuggling hard drugs like cocaine or heroin and um, but. It, it was interesting because it's one of the things that for somebody who didn't grow up hearing these names and doesn't know anything about them, they really try to make it seem like, oh, they're, they're, they're just these simple guys who they kind of stumble into this and they really don't want anybody to get hurt. And, and they say that. Sito's character says that a lot. Like, I didn't kill anybody. I never mm. killed anybody. Because he really kind of blocks out or they make it seem like he blocks out what is happening with the drugs that he's bringing in. Um, and I... You know, I don't, I don't know what you're supposed to make of that. I find it believable that these <clears throat> very well-established, successful Colombian drug cartels were more violent because mm -hmm. they had already established their strategies and their power and they were serious and they knew what they wanted to do and what have you. Um, whereas the Galician guys were just figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And yet... It's, it's hard to believe, and you find yourself feeling a little tricked as the show goes on, that to think like, oh, well, these were really good guys and they weren't really trying to do anything bad <laughs> because, you know, they make an absolute fortune. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and there are moments when the show just sort of makes it seem like the worst characteristics they have is they're a little bit greedy. <laughs> mm, that's right. They, they do appear as less, ex less experienced, uh... They they presented as they're presented as much less violent than the uh, the Colombian counter counterparts, yeah. and it's almost like they're playing in a totally different league, a much yeah. lower league. Like they like they are the minor leagues. Yeah, they're more like double A or single right. A, where the others are playing the majors. You know? And yet there are some hints early on with certain characters who have um, betrayed you know, the Charlinas, or that there, there is the threat of violence. And even Terito, who's the sort of the older, um, you know, established uh, authority in the, the period of, of tobacco smuggling, even he points a gun at one of his colleagues at one point when, when he disagrees with him. And so there is that threat of violence there. Mm -hmm. But then there are moments when they just make it seem like, oh, these guys... They're not. They wouldn't hurt anybody, mm. and so it. You know, I don't. It's interesting. But with with the Colombians, the, the threat becomes a reality. Uh, <clears throat> even you know because they kill certain people when right. the Galician smugglers like Cito don't want right. them to do it, but right. they still do it anyway. Right. As though we're going to teach you how to do this because you don't seem to know right. how. Right. Right. Uh, I feel uh, to 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 uh, conclude, um, Aaron, that. I don't know if you if you agree with this, but what we've been mentioning about C. Dominianco and the other Galician smugglers, it seems to be that the show, you know, whatever the reality is with these smugglers, with these criminals mm -hmm. um, from Galicia, it seems to me that the show attempts to humanize C. Dominianco yeah. uh, quite a bit, uh, to show him as a somewhat conflicted character yeah. who wants the money but supposedly doesn't want to have yeah. anybody killed, um, a, a character that, you know, somehow is a more human character than definitely the Colombian smugglers, and even some of the other Galician smugglers as well. Yeah, he is, and I, it's one of the things that I think, I go back and forth because I think it's either, you know, um, the show is just really trying to sell the characters so that, you know, you root for them and want to watch, or it's really just trying to trick you into having some of the feelings that the local 
communities had for them. Because mm -hmm. what's funny is I keep thinking in my head when I think of Sito in the show is almost a Robin Hood figure, <laughs> except he doesn't steal from the rich and give to the poor. He keeps all the money. Yeah, and now, he becomes richer. Yeah, richer. and he becomes richer and richer. Now, he, he does invest a lot in the community, so he gives a lot of money away. But he has plenty for himself. He basically has a... A, a sort of a mini palace and he's mm -hmm. got these expensive cars and they you know he's so it, it's he's not a Robin Hood figure but you get that feeling a little bit and, and one of the other ways I think they do that on the show is that um, the theme song Farina you said earlier that it appears sometimes in the episodes not just at the beginning and um, they do a good job of bringing in the Galician bagpipes mm -hmm. um, while still making it sound quite modern. Mm -hmm. um, and they tended, I think, to do that quite a bit when Sito was in a scene or there was mm -hmm. a big moment for Sito because he sort of represents this Galician um, presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, I think that kind of makes him this likable, rootable you know, uh, character, but you know, then you go, why? <laughs> why do I think this about him? Because he's just, you know, he's in denial a lot about what it is that they're doing, and I, I also find it hard to believe that he would be in so much denial. Mm -hmm. You know, like in real life, I mean, he must, he knew what he was doing. Oh yeah, definitely. So. In, in fact, he kept doing it. You know, after he was convicted. Yeah. And then he yeah. was. Uh, kind of tried to be re, uh, he was tried to uh, he was released and sort of reinserted into society and then he and he got arrested he, he again. got arrested again yeah. so he definitely uh, needed to know yeah. what 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 he was doing for sure and the music that you mentioned besides the song by Ivan Ferreiro there's also some um, Galician pop yeah. rock punk yeah, music it's a from great the 1980s and I the, thought they did a great and, job and I could recognize music. a lot of the songs yeah. you know by groups like Os Resentidos and several other groups that uh, were popular yeah. in uh, Siniestro Total yeah. some groups that were popular yeah. in in Spain and in Galicia in particular in particular in the 1980s well and and I know or I well I, I imagine that a lot of people um, over here will not be very familiar with Spanish rock um, but I think people will be pleasantly surprised. There's a lot of really nice, cool songs in, in the episodes. And some of the traditional music in yeah. the northwest of Spain and Galicia. Oh, yeah. Are, that was something is, they, is they really did, Celtic too, is they, they showed the, the tavern song. Mm -hmm. um, that um, it's, it's a meeting of all the drug dealers, <laughs> and they're sitting around having coffee after their meal, and they are singing a traditional tavern song, and... Um, for people who have never heard one, like there's a lot of the, everybody taps their hands on the table. I don't know. It's, they they beat. Uh, they create a beat with their hands and they sing these songs and it's really cool to hear and see. And um, they do that and it, it's making it again. They they seem like just likable characters. likable yeah. community you, you, leaders. You just want to join in their table yeah, and, and, and eat the, of, the seafood was, and the fish. I, and, uh, that was interesting. And of um, course, there's also a lot of that Celtic music that yeah. is traditional in the northwest of Spain and Galicia. And a lot of people may not know uh, about that kind of music, which is very similar to Scottish yeah. uh, bagpipe, fiddle, you know, music uh -huh. or Irish. Uh, music as well so you know you get uh, to know about these drug dealers you get to see a little bit of the culture yeah of, uh, cultural aspects of, of the Galicia. northwest of Spain yeah. of Galicia if you've never been there now we have been there many yeah. times so well, we recognize and yeah, a lot of that. I mean it, it, it really uh, looks a lot like what I recognize so at the end of the day and do we recommend the show and why yeah I would definitely recommend the show I love having different shows that I can watch to practice my Spanish and it was nice to hear Galish and I I hear a lot of Galish when we go to Spain and so it wasn't too distracting for me because I, I hear it when we're over there but um, it was fun to get to practice um, but it it was you know just another look into um, Galician culture certainly um, the drug culture I was not familiar with in, in that history and, and um, the characters are compelling even if they're um, made to seem a little bit more likable or quite a bit more likable than I imagine they were um, the actors do a great job I thought because we talk sometimes about how Spanish movies are really well done but Spanish TV shows sometimes don't have the same subtlety or finesse and I thought this show did a much better job than I 
am used to seeing in some of the Spanish TV shows that we have watched. So it was well produced, really well thought through in terms of the use of, you know, the time frame, the characters, the lighting, the music. That like they they it was well put together. Um, and uh, you know, if if you're looking for a new flame, I. I I like Javier Rey, so <laughs> I think he sells the show pretty well. <laughs> well, I don't blame you for that. It, uh, as for me, it brings me back to, to the 1980s when I was growing up in northwest of Spain. I think the atmosphere, the ambience is really well recreated, and uh, the it is a nice thriller, sort of cat and mouse, as you mm -hmm. said before, sort of story. It's well told, the characters are compelling, and uh, I really, uh, if you like that kind of a show, uh, I really would recommend with no reservations whatsoever, this show. Uh, again, the title of it is Cocaine Coast in English, in, in Galician. Farina. And uh, it's available right now in the United States, and I think in Europe as well, on Netflix uh, for, um, for streaming. Not on DVD, but for streaming, and you'd be able to watch it if you uh, have a Netflix account. And I really do recommend we really do recommend yes. that you do yes, that. Yes, we do. Now, it wasn't that hard to do this, thing, was it? <laughs> I kind of coerced you to do, into doing this. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I haven't done any podcasts with you before. and uh, It's about time, too. I kind of laugh that it's about uh, Cocaine Coast just because it's not really my topic, uh, uh, my, my specialty. But, um, but I did enjoy the show quite a bit. So. And I enjoyed chatting with you uh, with uh, coffee here. Yes. And uh, maybe we can have some coffee some other time and do something similar about something else that's not cocaine coast. Yeah, vamos a ver. <laughs> Eso espero. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, interest in the podcast. Uh, and this has been uh, an episode in which Anton Garcia Fernandez and Aaron Garcia Fernandez talk about cocaine coast out on Netflix right now. The um, copyright of this uh, podcast is Anton Garcia Fernandez and Aaron Garcia Fernandez. The year was 2018, and it was recorded live in Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. Thank you so much. See you again real soon. Watch Cocaine Coast, Farina, and we'll see you again on Anton GF, the YouTube channel. So long, everybody. <laughs>